you know, if you, if you look at the world around us, everybody wants us to be afraid. Everyone, you know, the, the media spends most of its time telling us to be afraid of something. The, uh, you know, um, corporate interests pretty much always tell us to be afraid of something. Because if we're afraid of something, we maybe buy something to help overcome the fears. And everyone benefits but us. And, <clears throat> you know, I realize that uh, a lot of times when you face fears straight on is when we actually are able to completely overcome them. And I'll start with a little story from my, from my youth. I was about 15 years old or so. One morning, uh, I get up, and uh, in my living room, there's about 15 uh, IRS agents with guns drawn on my dad. And uh, they're there to haul all of our farm equipment away. My dad had gotten a little tiff with the IRS, and they decided they were going to make an example out of him and take all of his farm equipment. Which, uh, you know, hey, lots of guns. They, it wasn't right. They didn't have the authority to do that. But you don't, you know, hey, you want to die or you want to lose your farm equipment. So that's, that's at least the way that it comes across. And you know, fear, IRS is one of those scary things, right? You know, hey, very few people are uh, not afraid of that. But you know, <clears throat> after going through that, and in fact, you know, that did in fact happen. They hauled away our farm equipment. Uh, they levied my dad so that he couldn't... Uh, they took 100% of any wages that he got. They uh, levied everything in his name. And uh, it stayed that way for almost five years. So it changed my life. I uh, quit school, went to work, and supported the family. And I realized very quickly, very quickly, that... Um, I wasn't going to be able to support the family um, as a farmhand. It's the only thing I knew how to do. So I got a job as a farmhand. You know, $4.12 an hour or something like that. Wasn't going to cut it. <clears throat> so about 30 days in or so, and I have got my first paycheck, which wasn't much, uh, I went and told my the farmer I was working for, I said, I'll make you a deal. I'll work for you for free. Don't pay me nothing. Um, but let me use your equipment on the weekends. And so that was my first uh, crazy entrepreneurial venture. He said, uh, he says, oh, well, that sounds like a pretty good deal. He said, you'll take care of it and fuel it up and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll take I'll care of it. You just, uh, you know, let me use it on the weekends and I'll... Uh, I'll work for you 40 hours a week plus, won't even, you know, and uh, no problem. So we did that for like three years. And uh, nights and weekends, I farmed our own farm that didn't have any equipment. So then we were able to actually uh, support the family, pay the taxes and all that good stuff. So in many ways, that that changed my life and my family's life for the better. A couple major things happened. One is it pulled the family together. Before that, everyone was kind of going their own way. After that, that wasn't the case. We were unified. And it was very, you know, hey, we had a common cause. It wasn't, you know, hey, yeah, the IRS was wrong. Dad was a little, he was black and white guy. They would have probably negotiated, but he said it's either right or it's wrong. Either I owe money or I don't. And, you know, IRS doesn't give you a day in court. So, you know, he, that's just the way that works. And <clears throat> so after realizing what would look like your worst fears, in reality, it was one of the biggest blessings of my life. Because, hey, I was kind of good at school. 
I thought I was off, you know. Everyone said, oh, yeah, I'm, you're going to be college-bound doing all the stuff, right? Probably get into banking or something super exciting like that. Yeah. How much of a blessing is that to folks, guys? You know, who wants to be blessed by a banker? Hey, God. No. So, but it, it led me to a strong value of the farm, farming life. And, and very soon I realized, hey, a farmer, and my dad started farming organically in 73. Before it was cool, this was all happening after that. Um, before that, he was... He sold, uh, even during those years, we sold to uh, Bob Moore, Bob's Red Mill. Uh, that, was our, that was our market. But we looked, and a farmer, a farmer, there's, there's two things. A farmer holds out both hands, and he says, how much and how much? How much do I pay for stuff? How much do you, you give me for my stuff? You guys been in that quandary as farmers, even small farmers? There's nothing in control but quantity, which makes bad quality. It incentivizes horrible quality. And then we have the consumer out here, the consumer that would really like food that will keep them slightly healthy, and there's no way to, nowhere to go. So the dream that I had 35 years ago was to say, can we find a way to get the farmers that really care with people who really care about what they eat? There are farmers that care about the soil. My granddad used to say the farmer is the guardian of the nation's health. Okay, if we really the guardian of the nation's health, but then if we grow our grain and we just dump it into the grain bin with everybody else's grain that doesn't give a rip, how much help are we? Meh. Not much. So that creates, that requires an infrastructure and the building of an infrastructure to be able to, to be able to do that. To be able to give people who really care about nutrient-dense food, food that's grown in soil, that's the nutrients that are made from that food are come from microbial action in the soil and not some, not, not some artificial chemical like anhydrous ammonia or something else. And farmers that are growing it that way. And truthfully, being able to give the farmers a little bit more money and negotiate with them on what they're getting paid um, is a pretty important aspect of that. Then the farmer at least has some aspect. Oh, my food's a little better than that. You know, I'm certified organic. I'm, you know, I do all the stuff. I do nutrient rent, uh, dense food. I follow these protocols. Oh yeah, your food's worth a little more. It's worth more to me. I want my body to take in food that has all the natural occurring minerals vitamins from the soil, not just, you know, empty carbs and fats. Do, you, do we really want that? So, <clears throat> so I begin to think, you know, in my life, that was a big deal. I was the shy kid, right? I wasn't in school, you know, I was like, you know, scholar, but Hey, never, never raise my hand. No, no. I always want to make sure that, uh, you know, I was background only. Um, so it was a lot to be able to connect consumers and farmers. You got to do some of these things. You got to actually talk to farmers, negotiate with them. And then you got to go out and actually market. And it's like, you know, spent... Uh, a bunch of time going to stores, visiting health food stores, that kind of thing to create those markets. 
the fear of doing that, for me, that was a very, very real fear. It was like, ugh, this is like, got to talk to people. This is, this is super scary. And you know what? They might tell me, get lost. I ain't buying any of that stuff. And I actually heard that quite a bit. You know, usually in nicer terms than that. But, you know, get lost was a pretty common occurrence because most of the stores are locked into distribution networks. So they're locked into a major distributor. And back then, it was a lot less uh, stringent than it is today. Today, there's, you know, in the health food industry, organic food industry, I should say, there's really only uh, two distributors nationwide. And when I started, when I started doing this back in the 90s, there were about 35. So that is all consolidated, 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 and created more and more power for those two big players. You know, if you, you as a farmer that maybe is going to create a product, and I want to say don't be scared to do that. If you, uh, you know, if you're starting your farm, small farm, big farm, um, create a product. Make a product that people can actually use. Commodities farming, its days are over. You know, John mentioned, uh, you know, my neighbor has 30,000 acres that he farms. That's commodities farming. That's the way that that's done. And do you have that? Can you afford that? That's, you know, they've been doing it since actually uh, in my hometown of Dufer, that particular farmer uh, was the great green granddaughter of Mr. Dufer. It's like, you know, they're, uh, that, fa that farm has been in the family since uh, the town was established. And they've expanded it tremendously, right? And commodities farming is that way. Unless you get into it, unless you were born into it, you may as well forget it. And, you know, I'm not saying it's a great plan anyway because you're looking at nutrient-deficient food. And that's exactly what is so important to, um, to avoid, at least in my opinion. Now, let's go one step further with fear. How do we react to fears in our own life, in our own family? I know, you know, I have a lot of kids, right? I have 11 children. And one of the things that faced us early on is, you know, and every young parent faces this, how are you going to work? How are you going to treat your children? Are they going to grow up rambic, rambunctious, wild, climbing trees, swimming in the river? And doing all the stuff that kids do, depending on where you're at, doing all the chores, doing the work, are they going to grow up? Are you going to keep them in a little safety bubble? Hey, oh, stay right here. Sit in the house. It's, you know, these video games are pretty good. That's really safe. You won't, uh, you won't fall off your bike, especially without a helmet. And uh, you won't get hurt. But... Are there things in life, for instance, raising your children, are there things in life that are worth more than safety? Are you willing to take a risk with the health, well-being, and safety of your child for the health, well-being, and safety of their spiritual and psychological life? Is that a risk? Let me tell you that there, 
Yeah, children are meant to eat dirt. <laughs> They're meant to play in the garden. They're meant to climb out, at, fall out of trees and all the stuff, fall off their bikes. None of that is last. Those scars are not lasting. They will get over them. They are not meant to face social problems that even adults have trouble dealing with. And looking at all those things online and trying to figure out, oh, it's such a terrible place. No. They need to have a happy and strong world. And you know, the stronger, you know, we fear, oh, for our children's health, what if they eat dirt? But the health begats health. Strength begats strength. So if you have children that are running wild, and I'm not saying completely disobedient, that's a different, you know, that's a different thing. But if you have children that are running wild and are strong and healthy, they're going to stay strong and healthy. They're going to get stronger and they're going to get healthier and they're going to get more robust as they grow into teenagers and young adults. No, they're not going to be the ones that have pains and aches. They're going to have them, but that's going to be because they're sore and because they fell or they ran too much or they did something in real life. There are things in life that are worth taking a risk for. Now I want to bring that down to, to life on the farm or on the homestead. You know, as, as we move forward, you know, I've talked to a lot of folks that have gone, uh, gone more rural lately. Great thing. But there's a very strong mix on what, why did we go rural? Why did we move out of the city or move on to a little farm? And about half tell me that, hey, the government's in a whale of trouble. We look like we're going to have an economic meltdown. People are going to go wild in the city. And I don't want to be there. I want to be somewhere where I'm out and I can raise my own food and do those things. Now, I'm not saying whether or not any of that is true or false. No opinion from my side. I'm saying maybe true, maybe not. I don't know. I have no prediction on how the government's doing. But I do know that if that's the primary motive for starting your homestead and moving out into the country, you're going to get disenchanted pretty fast. Because I tell you what, it's a lot of work. It ties you down, but there's a lot of benefits. Now, if you did it because you wanted the benefits, you wanted a real home, you know, the first part of homestead is a home. Don't forget that. Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in, oh, how, how are the chickens doing, and how's the, you know, are we going to have enough pasture for the cow, and milking the cow every day, and maybe delivering the milk to the neighbors, or however, whatever you guys do on, uh, on your farm. But remember, it's about a home. So living a life of togetherness, starting with our family, if that can bring our family closer together, which it certainly has to us, especially after that original experience that I, I mean, this has been many years ago. But doing that and giving the children responsibilities very young in my house gave them a sense of belonging and it created a lot of togetherness in our family. So 
I need you. If we say that to our children, and it's not just fake. We're not just saying, oh, you're a good kid. No, I really need you. After all, we've got three cows to milk. I can't do that by myself. I need you. Or in the case of my sons, my older sons particularly, they they used to pull orders in the warehouse, right? I was just getting Azure started and very few uh, order, you know, or order pickers and I was still having trouble balancing that. And then I'd get a big day and heck, the truck still has to leave. So I'd get my kids out there. Come on, kids, I need you in the warehouse today. You got to pick orders. Yeah. The guys in the warehouse would say, Oh, he's sending in the Calvary. <laughs> that was my kids, right? You know. Okay. But, but that didn't hurt them. That set them in really good stead for, for life. And as we look at what are we, what is our purpose? Do we have a purpose in what we're doing? Is there something that we care about? Is there something that's more important to us than the fear? Do we have a purpose? Is our purpose to generate help or a better life for other people? Is that, you know, really, if, when it gets right down to it, our purpose in life has to be something along those lines. We're generating a better life for us, for our family, for our community, and for our larger community, our nation, and our, our world. Those are the only real objects. Now, that can be done in a million different ways. There is no limit. Tell you the truth, you know, I feel like there is more opportunity today for people who care, that have a purpose than, I've ever, than there's ever been in history. We have, you know, at least in the food industry, and you got, you know, if you're on a small farm, you, that's the place it starts. It's been conglomerated into these big corporate mega food companies. They don't care about anything but corporate, corporate profits. Sometimes even if they do have an organic seal on there really doesn't make that much difference. Yeah, they probably followed the paperwork. And yeah, it's probably a little better food than what the one without it is. But it's not really what it's about. The marketplace is looking for companies, for people who care. And I dare say that that's true in almost any industry. If you care about the food that you're raising, we care about the trade that we're doing. And is it more important than the fears that we have from doing that? Are we willing to step out? You know, in my life, it's been a strong, you know, I've had to overcome fear more and more and more times. You know, I started as a shy kid that wanted to, that figured I needed to market our farm products, right? It was me, myself, and I. Yeah, that's it. And every time I had to give responsibility away, I had to train somebody new to do that, there's a little piece of you that's absolutely terrified when you do it. Can, can you change that role from being, you know, Driving the truck. I mean, I used to drive the truck for years, make do deliveries and stuff. You go from driving the truck to managing a fleet of truck drivers, that's dang scary. You talk about the regulatory stuff that goes along with that, yeah, that's even scarier. You know, and in my life, I went from one, a company of one, to now we're 350 people in, in Azure. It's, you know, it's a, you know, and it happened over years. It didn't happen in one day. You don't have to learn all that, but every single time that we make that change so that we can help more people in our purpose, 
there is a huge fear that comes in, that comes into play at least most of the time in my life. You know, it's not like you know, you say, "Oh, well, you're so lucky. You know, you have a whole big team and all that." Yeah. Well, it doesn't work that way. I will tell you, luck has absolutely nothing to do with it. That's a zero. No. Now, faith may have something to do with it. Purpose has something to do with it. The blessings of God might have something to do with it. Luck, not so much. Your, as you move forward, there's, there's two things to keep in mind. Number one, how can I bless my fellow man? Other people, and I'm not saying that doesn't include yourself and your family. It does. But how can I bless other people? How can I be a larger blessing? That's purpose, and that's faith. How can I hide in the shadows, stay under the radar? That's fear. And you know, Sometimes you have to deal with regulatory agencies head on. I'm not saying that you won't. You will. And that may sound scary, but it's really not as scary as it is a pain in the butt. It really is more that. There, yeah, just two weeks ago, I spent four days with the FDA on just one little thing. Huh? You know, we just we have this little cannery line, right? I employ three people there. This is like we do we can, you know, pickles and some tomato products and stuff like that on this cannery line. So in the little corner up by our apple packing line, FDA decided, "Oh, we're going to check that out. We're going to check every piece of paper that you've ever done." You know, yeah. The heck it's pain in the butt. Four days out of your life that they get to go, oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you do just this straight? Yeah. Um, Did you record the temperature? Did, yeah. Well, oh, that's right. Uh-huh. That just right. No. Uh-huh. It's more of a pain in the butt. It's not really that scary. Those guys really don't have much authority except the authority that the industry gave them. And remember that most of regulation has been made to keep you guys down as small farmers. It's the big corporate interests that have lobbied Congress to say, hey, regulate canning companies, regulate dairies, no raw milk. Oh, yeah, you don't want raw milk because the cheese industry in the state, you guys could hurt them. You could take a big chunk out of their profits because you do better stuff than they do. You know, I don't know what the dairy company is here in Ohio. For I should have looked that up. But in Oregon, it's Tillamook, right? Tillamook cheese, Tillamook milk, all the stuff. And they lobbied the state of Oregon legislature to say, hey, no raw milk in this state. It's not because the legislature gives a rip. The industry lobbied the state to create the agencies to keep you down. How about you lobby the state to keep them down? There's more of you. Change it. We don't need to fly under the radar. We don't need to be afraid. We need to build community. Get with your your neighbors. Make friends with your neighbors that are slightly of like mind. Learn to work on a common purpose if you can. And of course, have a purpose. Faith and purpose is, will always win if you're able to kick fear out. And I'm not saying that we have no fear. Remember, uh, there was a, maybe it was a John Wayne quote or something that says, you know, Fear is, or uh, courage is, being terrified and saddling up anyway. Remember, sometimes 
We have to go through that bad thing. We have to get bucked off and feel what the ground feels like. And it may not feel exactly good, but we realize that it's not really that bad either. We can survive it. And if our purpose is strong enough that we, that we don't, that, it's, we're, that we're willing to take some lumps, some pain, to make that purpose become a reality and a dream. That's what I want to encourage everyone to do, is to think. There's a lot of you folks out here. If every one of you creates a livelihood, a business with purpose to change the world in whatever area that you're working, there's a lot of momentum. Those corporate giants won't even know what happened to them. They really won't. It's not, you know, they're just, they're all just employees. They're just employees of that corporate monolith. There's not a lot of loyalty there. No, it's, it's not, it's not incredibly difficult to win. We just have to tell our story, tell why, and we have to be willing to do things we're not comfortable with, like marketing, like sales, like communication, and sometimes getting our hands dirty. That's just, you know, it's the way that it goes. And hey, I'm very, you know, and Azure, one of our primary core values at Azure is to support independent and family-owned businesses and companies. And we do want to do that as well. So we are here as a support to any of you guys. If you start, at least in the food industry, if you start something and you need an alternative to those big boys that really couldn't give a rip about you, that's partly why we're here. And so, you know, reach out. I invite any of you. And I will definitely be, a, be around the rest of the day. We have a booth down, I think it's at the end of Tent B. I'd love to see and meet any of you. Thank you for your time and blessings.